Hello everyone and welcome back to the Analog King Air. We are all set for takeoff here at Key West International in Florida today. We're going to be taking a look at the custom avionics in this aircraft, the different avionics setups that you can use, the primary instrumentation, autopilot, flight director, and I will demonstrate an emergency gear extension in flight for fun. Let's take a look at the takeoff checklist here. You can see that we're going to advance the power levers to the limitations specified in the pilot's operating handbook. We'll be limited by either gas generator RPM on a particularly hot day, torque of 100%, or ITT of 820 degrees Celsius, though we probably won't get anywhere near that today since a maximum performance takeoff is not required for such a light aircraft. While we advance the power levers, we're going to be sure to do so slowly and carefully while watching the propeller RPM to make sure that we don't outpace the propeller governors and send the RPM past the red line. As a reminder, everything that you do to the engines in this aircraft is being monitored and can result in a chip detect or a catastrophic engine failure. As the aircraft accelerates, we're going to be looking for the auto feather systems to arm on both engines with the green AFX lights here and a rotation speed of 110 knots today, at which point we will raise the nose to 10 degrees nose high, and as soon as we see a positive rate, bring the gear up. That's because in a twin engine aircraft, we're not looking to land on the remaining runway, but instead to clean up the configuration of the aircraft in case of an engine failure after takeoff. When we have the time, we can turn off the landing lights, even though they go off automatically when the gear comes into the wheel wells, engage the autopilot and raise the flaps at 125 knots. The last step of the takeoff checklist once we're stabilized is to look at the pressurization of the cabin. We should see that a climb is indicated. This lets us know that the bleed air valves are working and that the cabin pressurization controller knows that we've left the ground and that we're in a climb. Before we take off, for anyone not familiar with the pressurization system in the King Air, you can see that there's two scales here, an inner and outer scale, that always move together. The outer scale is the desired cabin pressurization altitude, here set to 4,000 feet. The inner scale is the maximum altitude that we can climb the aircraft to and still maintain the desired cabin pressurization altitude. Here you can see 22,000 feet. So when we climb the aircraft past 22,000 feet, so too will the cabin climb past 4,000 feet. And that's because there's a maximum cabin differential pressure that can be maintained by the system. We can see on the inner scale here, it's approximately 6.7 PSI. When we enter this red line condition, we will hear a warning sound, see the cabin differential pressure high warning enunciator, and the cabin pressurization controller will automatically activate the dump valve, thereby reducing the differential pressure, but raising the cabin pressurization altitude in the process. It's best to avoid this condition, especially at high cruising altitudes, since the activation of the dump valve can be uncomfortable for passengers' ears. Without further ado, let's get out on the runway and get things started. Okay, we are all ready for takeoff here. We've gone through our takeoff checklist. Before we go, I'm gonna pull up the wonderful TDS GTN 750 GPS and show you our route of flight. We're going to be taking off from Key West International, making a climbing left-hand turn to 8,000 feet, roll out on heading 280, which I'll bug in the HSI, and do so while avoiding flying into the Key West Naval Air Station's class Delta airspace. Our destination is going to be Dry Tortugas National Park, which is a popular tourist destination 70 miles off the west coast of the Florida Keys in the middle of the ocean. The reason for this specific destination will become clear once we're in the air. Speaking of which, let's get things rolling. I'm going to release the brakes and advance the power levers. We're watching the propeller RPM. Once it's clear the prop governor is holding us at max RPM, we can increase the power levers more. Watch the torque bloom as airspeed accelerates. We can see both engines have their auto feather systems armed. We're watching now for 110 knots rotation speed. Pitch the nose 10 degrees up. Gear comes up and flaps up at 125 knots. 
We'll begin our turn to the left no sooner than 400 feet above field elevation. And there's the left turn. No more than 30 degrees bank. And once we've completed the turn and rolled out on 280, we will engage the autopilot and then finish our takeoff checklist. Room to spare on the airspace there. And we can begin the rollout on 280. We can decrease the torque a bit, trim things out, and then engage the autopilot. When we turn on the autopilot, you'll see that it goes into a roll hold mode and a pitch hold mode. The pitch hold is whatever we were doing when we engaged the autopilot, and the roll hold is zero degrees bank angle. We can adjust that by turning the large knob out of the detent here on the autopilot controller and adjust a bank angle anywhere from 5 to 30 degrees in either direction. It'll keep doing this until we activate another mode of the autopilot, which here we'll do heading hold and climb profile mode. Climb profile mode is going to hold us at 160 knots airspeed. Descent profile mode holds at the barber pole speed minus 20 knots. If you want to adjust either of these reference speeds, you can use the up and down rocker switch on the autopilot controller that would ordinarily be used to adjust your vertical speed. You can adjust plus or minus in one knot increments. I also want to call your attention to the flight director command bars on the primary flight instrumentation here. If you didn't want to let the autopilot have all the fun and do some of the flying yourself, you can press the autopilot disconnect button once. You see the autopilot master is disconnected, but the relevant autopilot modes are still active, and most importantly, so is the flight director. So now you can fly the aircraft into the command bars, and you'll end up in the exact same place as if you let the autopilot do all the flying for you. Press the uh, autopilot disconnect button again, by the way, to disengage all the autopilot modes and the flight director. We'll reactivate the autopilot now, heading and climb profile mode. Next, let's take a look at where we're headed. As you can see, Dry Tortugas in this patch of airspace here above its national park is well outside of the US ADIS, the Air Defense Identification Zone, this pink dotted line here. And that means that on our way back in, we're going to have to say on our flight plan where and when we plan on penetrating back into the US airspace. Ordinarily, this would be done with a GPS waypoint, but there's no waypoint here. It could also be done with intersecting VOR radials, but the only other VOR other than Key West is well over 100 nautical miles away. So we could use an arbitrarily defined GPS user waypoint, but that's inconvenient for both parties and doesn't allow for any redundancy and monitoring. So instead, what we're going to do is define a distance and radial away from the Key West VOR, 1,000 to go, and monitor using the KNS-80 RNAV computer. I've already entered Key West VOR 113.5 into the KNS-80 and a radial of 270 degrees at a distance of 16 and a half nautical miles. You can see we have DME information here. What this does is create a virtual VOR at that offset that we can navigate to just like a real VOR. If you want to see more information on how to set this up, you can look at the first video of the analog caravan where it's covered in a little more detail. For now, we're going to switch the HSI source to RNAV and use the course select knob to fly right to it. We can see the bearing pointer there and adjust the heading select and fly right to the virtual VOR. We're now only seven nautical miles away. When we get close, we can even adjust the course select to be orthogonal to our path of travel 
and line up with the edge of the ADIS and use it just like a VOR fence from another source. When we get close, we'll switch to the GPS and take a look at how close our piece of 1980s technology is to the same precision as a modern day GPS. Finishing our checklists here, finally, we can turn off the landing lights. We should check our cabin pressurization. We've actually leveled off at the desired 4,000 feet with a cabin pressure differential of about 2.8 PSI. Next, the climb checklist. 785 degrees max on the ITT. We're good. Propeller RPM can stay at maximum. Propeller sync on. Engine instruments. Everything looks good in the green. No ice protection required. Exterior lights are as required. Windshield anti-ice can stay off since we're staying at such a low altitude. And the pressurization system is already set. Only two and a half nautical miles to go to our destination. We can now switch into a VOR fence mode and watch the CDI center when we cross through the ADIS. If we were interested in monitoring our position relative to the actual Key West VOR at the same time, by the way, we can select 113.5 and transfer into our NAV1 radio and see where we are on the RMI. Here we go, crossing the ADIS about now. Well, I would say that that was one precise ADIS crossing. Next, let's take a look at where we're headed. We're going to this patch of airspace here, Dry Tortugas. It, of course, you guessed it, doesn't have any GPS waypoints or any nav aids on the little island out there. So what we're going to do is use the KNS-80 again, where I have a second waypoint already set up at the uh, Dry Tortugas island. We're going to press display. We can now see that we have a different radial and a different distance loaded and press use to load it into the active slot. We can see different DME information and now we can fly right to that point. Once we've activated uh, RNAV source on the HSI, we can fly right to that virtual VOR as if it were a real one. You can see that we have DME information right here on the HSI. It's the same as what's displayed on the RNAV computer. We can also get it in a third way by going to channel 3 on the IND42 DME unit. You can see that we have uh, 37 nautical miles to go, 255 knots, 8.7 minutes, and the ID says RNAV, so we know that we're pulling the DME information from the correct source. On the HSI, we also have the same distance, time to go, speed, and elapsed time, which can be set and reset with this button right here. That is a different chronometer than what's on the yoke, so you actually have two chronometers available to you for your IFR flying. Next, what I want to do is slow things down a little bit. I'm going to bring back the power levers and get us below 165 knots so that we can practice an emergency manual gear extension. If I bring back the throttles too far while in flight, by the way, we can hear a gear configuration warning horn, which we can silence with the button here. So let's say that we were coming in for a landing and we put our gear down and we discovered that it just wasn't going to budge. This is perfectly feasible with the new comprehensive failure system in the steam gauge overhaul aircraft, by the way. So the first thing that we would do, of course, is to pull up our checklists. So let's go look for the manual gear extension checklist. There's only three items, so how hard could it be? Well, it's going to be a workout, at least. You'll see why. The first step is to pull the landing gear relay out of the panel. Then put the gear handle in the down position. If we take a look at the outside of the aircraft, we can see that the gear is in fact not coming out of the wheel well. The next thing we have to do is pump the emergency gear extension handle located here under the pilot's seat next to this placard. It's going to take quite a number of pumps to get the gear moving. It is a lot of hydraulic fluid to move from the reservoir in the aircraft into the landing gear. After we put about a dozen or so into this, we're going to take a look in the outside of the aircraft. I can hear some drag noise, so something is happening. Let's take a look. We can see the gear doors are open, but the landing gear still has quite a ways to go. 
while we're pumping the handle here, we're gonna look for the three green indicators next to the gear handle for when the gear is down and locked. Make sure to pay attention to your airspeed while you're doing this since the increased drag can slow you down. Let's take a look at where we're at now. Looks like the left-hand landing gear is gonna be the one to win the race and the rest still have a little ways to go. Uh, the left is down and locked. We see the green light. And now the nose and the right is down and locked. Let's take a look outside. Sure enough, they look good. We can continue our approach to land as normal. Just adjusting our course here. So hopefully this was just practice though and everything is working. We can go to the next checklist and stow the emergency gear handle, push the relay back in and pull the gear handle up. I hear the pump running, the drag noise is decreasing, so the landing gear has come back up and into the wheel wells. Next I wanna show you one of my favorite features of the King Air, which is its nighttime lighting. I'm going to turn on the panel master switch in the overhead panel here, and then switch us to the evening. Whether you find that uh, intimidating or a thing of beauty, I think we can say it'll certainly impress your passengers. All of the panel integrity lighting and the instrument indirect lighting are controlled via the knobs in the overhead here, as is that green under panel lighting that we saw in the previous video, which is great for flying around sunset time or getting yourself situated and set up on the ground. Sirius Simmers will enjoy the custom coded Collins CTL radio navigation equipment here, each of which has six slots of frequency memory that can be accessed by holding this toggle switch to the MEM position. If you want to adjust the frequency that's in one of the slots, you change the standby frequency and then press store. It'll be in that slot there. You can see the memory indicator saying this frequency is stored in our memory somewhere. And that won't just be for the duration of this flight, but it'll be next time you load the aircraft to all of these frequencies and everything stored in this equipment is saved and reloaded next time you start the aircraft. You can also use the tiny active frequency adjust button underneath the dual concentric rotary encoder to adjust only the active frequency and leave the standby alone. You can also press the test button to see if there's any relevant diagnostic codes indicative of a failure in the radio navigation system. Now we're going to pop out to a pre-recorded video so I can show you what I believe is the only working windshield wipers in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Okay guys, real quick, I know we've all seen windshield wipers that go back and forth before, but how many have we seen that actually clear off the rain? Look at that nice sharp arc at the top of the wiper blade, and wherever the wiper hasn't been for a while, the raindrops accumulate back up, just like in the real world. And that actually varies depending on how hard it's raining, so you have to use the various windshield wiper speed settings in order to keep the windshield clean. And if we stop the windshield wiper somewhere in the middle, the rain accumulates back up again. That should really add some realism to your rainy flying. I know I've always enjoyed flying in the rain. It's just so cozy. It's one of my favorite things to do. Checking back in on our flight to Dry Tortugas here, we have only half a minute to go. One thing I forgot to mention before is that the HSI here has a deviation flag to show you whether you're looking at a linear or angular deviation, depending on whether you're using the RNAV computer, a regular radio navigation source, or whether you're using the RNAV computer in VOR mode. So one nautical mile to go. Let's see where we are. <laughs> there it is. I would say that that is one GPS-like precision arrival completed with 1980s technology. When you're 70 nautical miles or more away from any identifiable object on the horizon, it is imperative that you understand the totality of systems available to you in the aircraft and on the ground to increase situational awareness and overcome system failure. Don't be a child of the magenta line, simply pressing direct to enter enter to get to your destination. Instead, become a professional pilot and know how to use every piece of equipment on board your aircraft. 
I hope that you'll enjoy exploring the nearly 100-page manual that comes with the Analog King Air. It has electrical schematics and a comprehensive system guide that covers everything we've talked about today and so much more. I hope you have lots of fun destinations planned for yourself in this magnificent machine. Until then, I wish you blue skies, and I will see you in the next video.